Welcome to Make It Last, helping you keep your legal ducks in a row and your nest egg secure with your host, Victor Medina, an estate planning and elder law attorney and certified financial planner. Everyone, welcome back to Make It Last. I'm your host, Victor Medina. Thank you for joining me. This is episode 19. This is broadcast originally on August 19th, 2017. I have to let you know something. It is my wedding anniversary this date. I have been married 16 years, which means one important thing, which is I'm not live in studio today. This is all pre-recorded. I'm actually on vacation with my family. I've decided to spend the uh, the wedding anniversary with my wife, with my wife and our three kids. And we're on a little road trip. So we recorded this episode ahead of time, but it's still a good one. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, inheritance and uh, estate taxes that are in New Jersey. If you get lucky, I'll even talk to you a little bit about the taxes in other states, such as Pennsylvania, Florida, and, and places like that. And you know where you're going to be when you die and what the trade-offs are and what the taxes are. And it's going to be a delightful show. Can't wait for you to uh, join us. Before we get started on that, though, I got to tell you, I am uh, I'm worked up. I'm worked up. I'm worked up for two reasons. You know, the first reason is that there's a uh, a new report that came out that was conducted by some university professors, really trying to understand what the kind of sophistication of investors are and what their belief system is for uh, what advisors how advisors are acting and, and whether or not they're acting in their best interest. And at the same time, there's another uh, report that was done that was really kind of talking about um, the fights that are going on with the Department of Labor fiduciary role. So the, if you've been listening every week, this is old hat. I mean, I'm, I've been hitting on this, you know, as often as the news um, appears for me to be doing that because it's such an important topic. Um, but now there's even more. There's even more. So let me tell you how these two things work together. The report in the Wall Street Journal, I think it's the Wall Street Journal. Let me just check real quick. Yeah. So um, the, nope, it was The Intercept, right? It came out in July 16th, about a month ago. Anyway, it came out and they basically talked about how uh, the Trump administration and um, some other senators are fighting against this Department of Labor rule. In fact, there are, um, there are, New laws being proposed to roll back this fiduciary rule. And more importantly, as I've told you before, the fiduciary rule doesn't really even cover all of the situations that we want. Now, is this, if this is your first time listening, look, I can't stress the importance of being a fiduciary enough, right? You need somebody that's in your corner that is ethically and legally obligated to be putting your best interest first. And then Department of Labor put out this new rule that basically says that if somebody uh, helps give advice on your retirement account, they have to be acting in your best interest. So the article actually went through a couple of situations where, you know, advisors are working with people, you know, taking them out to rubber chicken dinners and they're uh, right into <laughs> chicken piccata, you know, something like that, right? So the ch rubber chicken dinner saying that we can help you protect your investment for retirement. And then they put them in these really, really volatile, illiquid real estate investments. And the reason why they did that was because the advisor could make 7% commission on what they put in there, you know, and just glossed over, glossed over all of the risks that were associated with that. And when you read that, with this um, new uh, study that came out about transparency in the investment industry, the public perception of brokers and investment advisors, and that, that was done by the Wall Street Journal, um, it's not a pretty picture at the end. You know, Part of the reason why I'm on this show talking to you about this is I, I can't work with everybody, I, but I need everyone to know that this is an important thing, that you have to be working with somebody who's a fiduciary. So when they did their... Um, when they did their survey and they did this study, it was, it was a real like quoted study by these college professors. They learned a couple of things. The first thing is that individuals tend to be confused by titles used in the investment professional industry. And the reason for that is because um, there's no regulation around it, right? So the people surveyed could understand the difference between a broker and a financial advisor right? Because the broker, they kind of know is kind of a salesperson. And then the financial advisor, they think is somebody else. But what they don't know, what they don't know is that the financial advisor or financial planner isn't a regulated term. The broker can call themselves a financial advisor and just still act like a broker and looking out for their interests instead of yours, right? And so when we look at, um, when we look at the way that people can kind of 
take impressions about who investment advisors are and what investment professionals, you know, what kind of qualifications they have, they're really mismatched for what the truth is. For instance, I'll give you another one. More than half of the people uh, surveyed, more than 50% believed that brokers have to have a college or a graduate degree. The truth is they don't have to have either, right? They have to pass one test. They don't need to have any college education. They don't even need to have any experience to become a broker. All they need to do is pass the test. Over 70% believed that investment advisors, which are distinct from brokers, right? Those are the people that run the IRAs, need to have a college or a graduate degree, okay? And that's not true either. You need to pass a test. You are a fiduciary, but there's no rules about how much education you need to have. I'll give you a contrast. Uh, I'm a certified financial planner, what they call a CFP. So when you're a CFP, you have to pass a test. And this test is in six areas of discipline for financial planning. And you need to sign up for, uh, you know, to agree to some ethical standards about, you know, being a fiduciary. You need to demonstrate experience as a planner. And you need to demonstrate a college degree. Okay, so that's one designation that is, is set up that's self-regulated. That CFP designation is really important because it, requ you know, basically requires somebody to be at this sort of base level of education and experience. And that kept going on through, you know, different um, surveys, right? You know, uh, people really still confused between the difference between a financial advisor, a wealth manager, a financial planner. You know, none of those words uh, have any bearing on any kind of regulation. And you shouldn't be fooled by them. Right. You look at the qualifications of somebody and look at, you know, what their experience is. Take a look at what their ethical obligations are, whether or not they're held to a fiduciary standard the way I am, like a registered investment advisor. I am held to a fiduciary standard as an investment advisor. And that's different than a broker. It's different than as an agent who works for, uh, for you know, one of the large wirehouses, brokerage houses, uh, the ones with the bulls on the front. Right. So those are different. They're held to different standards. Even the CFP requires a a college education. And then me, I, I got a legal education, right? I'm a lawyer on top of being uh, all of these other things. So you, know, you want to look at the qualifications of somebody and don't look at the title. People use the titles to seem impressive. Oh, I'm a wealth manager. Who cares? Okay. Just tell me what you actually do, right? What experience do you really have? How much money are you managing? How long you've been doing it? You know, <clears throat> how many clients do you have? What kind of, you know, what's your philosophy? What do you do? All of these things are more important than the title that's in there. And, you know, I'm going back full circle to the whole fiduciary thing. Um, over half of the folks that were surveyed still believe that the broker is working in their best interest when it's not true. It's not true. It's just simply not true. They don't have to. They don't. They sell to you things that pay them more. That's what a broker does. That's basically what they're doing. 60% of the investors had no idea how their financial professional charges for advice, or they think, here's the best one, <laughs> they think that the advice is free. All right. And, uh, and that's just not true either, right? That buildings need to be built and they got to pay for the paper and the pens and all that kind of stuff. There's money being made. So the advice is not free. You're paying for it somehow. It's really important to know how that is. Like when the way we work, we make sure that we're really transparent. Our fees are paid by the client. They pay us an asset under management fee. When we do asset management and we talk about the expenses of the investments and they, they see that in clear black and white on every statement. So I'm here, I'm, this is, this is my, this is my, uh, whatever. I'm tilting the windmills, right? <laughs> this is what I'm charging after. And I think it's really, really important to make sure that um, you are looking out for um, your best interest by making sure that you work with somebody that's also looking out for your best interest. So work with a fiduciary. All right. When we come back from the break, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, taxes, estate planning, I'm sorry, estate and inheritance taxes for New Jersey. I'll uh, sprinkle in some Pennsylvania since we're so close to the border and people think about retiring there, maybe a little bit about Florida. But stick with us when we come back from the break, all about taxes. I promise I will keep you awake you come back to make it last. Hey folks, you know, there are more than 500 different ways to claim your social security benefits. And most Americans will rely on their IRAs and 401ks to survive retirement. The pressure to make the right decisions at this stage of life can be enormous, as are the consequences for making a wrong decision. Victor Medina, host of Make It Last, is a certified financial planner that specializes in helping people in or nearing retirement. Working with families that have been diligent savers and who value a trusted advisor, Victor is able to put together a 
customized total protection retirement plan that helps clients answer four important questions. Can you afford to retire? Are you overpaying your income taxes? Can your portfolio be improved? Can you eliminate or reduce threats to your retirement? It's never been more important to make sure your ducks are in a row, and it's never been harder to make your nest egg secure. The time to act is now. Call 609-476-9269 or email info at privateclientfamily.com to schedule your no-cost, no-obligation first meeting and get on the road to total protection. All right, everybody, welcome back to Make It Last. I spent that first segment talking more about needing to work with a fiduciary, why that's important, um, super, super, super important uh, in your financial life. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that you stay on track with that. But I also want to answer um, kind of question that come up about inheritance and estate taxes. There's a lot of confusion about that. Now, back in November of 2016, Governor Christie and the, uh, the New Jersey Congress legislature came to an agreement where they were going to uh, trade off some taxes uh, in order to meet some political uh, needs that they needed to have in place. One of them was that they were going to increase the gas tax by 23 cents per gallon. A lot of you are really super aware of that. It came all of a sudden that New Jersey wasn't the place to go and buy gas. It used to be super cheap uh, and people would come over the border for that. But don't do that any longer because our gas tax increased by 23 cents. Now, a lot of people don't know the other half of that deal. And as part of the other half of the deal, New Jersey changed two taxes that are related to retirement and death. The first thing that they did was they increased the taxes uh, exemption for people who are retired and drawing retirement income. So it used to be before that there was only about $20,000 that was exempted from your retirement income. And if you made under $20,000, you didn't pay any New Jersey income. The new rule is different because they've increased that limitation to about uh, $75,000 if you are a single ind individual and $100,000 if you're a married couple. And so if you have below that number in retirement income, taxable retirement income, you don't pay any New Jersey retirement uh, income tax at all. That's pretty good. There's one little trick though, which is that if you make more than that by just $1, you're then taxed on the entire amount. That's very different than the federal income tax um, system, right? Because you know that if you make like $1 more than the top of a, of a tax bracket, you know, 10, 15%, you'll only pay 15% on that $1. They don't charge 15% against the whole thing. But New Jersey, in its infinite wisdom, has decided that it's going to charge you for the entire amount. So you make $100,000 and $1, you all of a sudden pay New Jersey income tax as a married couple. And if you only made $100,000 or less, you would pay zero. And that's pretty significant. So that's one part of the deal. You know, they're trying to make it more attractive for people to stay in New Jersey. There's a mass exodus when people retire um, because of the way that their income taxes are treated. They figure once they're done raising their kids, uh, well, it's time to get out. And um, there's, there was even a story. I don't know if you guys caught it, but there's even another story about an individual who uh, was like a hedge fund, lived in New Jersey. Hedge fund manager made, paid a huge amount in income tax finally decided to move to Florida to save himself on the income tax because Florida doesn't have any uh, income tax on wages like that. And um, anyway, you fast forward and it impacted the budget. Like this person moving out impacted how much New Jersey had to spend, one person. So that's the income tax situation. Now, let me contrast that with um, Pennsylvania because in Pennsylvania, they have a different tax structure altogether. And now where my practice is, I kind of sit on the border. You know, I'm in, I'm in Hopewell Valley. I'm in Pennington, Hopewell Valley. I'm right along the Delaware. I have a lot of my clients that are uh, Pennsylvania residents because we're licensed in there and we do a lot of work there. But I have a lot of people who were former New Jersey employees, a lot of state workers that retired, and they moved to Pennsylvania. And one of the reasons for that um, is first, uh, Pennsylvania has a flat income tax. So New Jersey has a has a has a graduated tax, right? A, um, a progressive tax. The more you make, the more tax you pay on it. You know, for up to I think like six and a half percent. I think there's even an eight percent number when you're at the top end. But in Pennsylvania, it's flat. It's just around 3% or so. It's 3.1, 3.5. It's a flat tax. No matter what you pay, and no matter what you make, that's what you pay on it. And that's on wage income. But they have this other wrinkle, which is that Pennsylvania doesn't tax any retirement income. So your Social Security, no matter how much other income you have, not taxed. Your pension, not taxed. You take distributions from your IRA, not taxed. And so people looking in retirement look to move to Pennsylvania as a way to save, to save on their income taxes. And that happens pretty regularly. In fact, you know, my parents, when they were um, retiring, they're both 
well, my mom and my stepdad, really, they were both school teachers and they, you know, worked towards a pretty healthy pension. That's, they didn't have a lot of savings in retirement, you know, a little bit, but not a ton. But their pension is what they were going to be living off of. So when they first retired, they retired to uh, Florida because they don't tax any of the income down there. They get to save that. They only pay federal income tax. And when they were tired of Florida and wanted to move somewhere else, we had to make some investigation about where to become residents because um, there are other, you know, they have, a, uh, they have an apartment. You don't know, but I said, you know, anyway, they have an apartment in, in New York, um, but New York, not great for income tax. So we had to look to other places. And one of the places we were looking at was Pennsylvania because it was so generous by not taxing the income taxes. But like everything else, there's a trade-off. The trade-off is that um, Pennsylvania does in fact have an inheritance tax. Now, in order to set this up, I got to kind of walk you through um, what inheritance and estate taxes are. Um, every year, Forbes puts out the worst places to die. And until recently, um, you know, they would paint uh, taxes, uh, states that charge in estate taxes in orange and states that charge inheritance taxes in red. And New Jersey was always striped in plaid because we have both of them. An estate tax is essentially a tax um, against the total value of what you own. And it's independent of who you give it to. So estate tax doesn't care, well, with one exception, if you give it to a spouse, there's no estate tax. But for the most part, if you give it to, whether it's a kid or the neighbor down the street, the estate tax is assessed on the total value and really doesn't matter who you give it to. That's an estate tax. That's based on the total amount that's in there. Now, the federal government's got an estate tax. The federal government has an estate tax that it comes into effect when you have more than $5.5 million, uh, or if you're a married couple, more than $11 million. Now, in order to get the $11 million exemption, you got to do a little extra planning, and that's usually where folks like me come in, but um, that's the level. So for the most part, you know, not going to impact our day-to-day -day friends, you know, five and a half million dollars. We do have clients that, that have that much, and we've done estate tax planning for them. It's a pretty regular part of what we do, you know, but it's not really a high percentage of the population. But that's at the federal level. The states can set their own level. Uh, until very recently, Ohio had uh, an estate tax that came in when you left more than $330,000 to somebody. As you know, it's pretty low. Um, New Jersey had an estate tax that is in the process of repealing. And when we come back from the break, I'll talk to you a little bit about what uh, the numbers for that are. But that's different and distinct from an inheritance tax. An inheritance tax is really a tax on who you give money to. Now, just about every state, in fact, I won't say every one because I'm not really certain about all 50, but my belief is that every state exempts transfers to spouses from any kind of tax. So if you can leave everything to your spouse, there's going to be no tax that's due, inheritance tax. But when we look at leaving it to kids, siblings, nieces, nephews, friends, charities, all of a sudden, if the state has an inheritance tax, it comes into play. So if we want to keep these two things separate, remember, we're looking at a inheritance tax as being based on who we give it to, and estate tax being based on how much we have. Now, when we come back from break, I'm going to explain to you what those limitations are, like what the numbers and exemptions are for each of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Florida, you know, and a few others, so that you really understand how to incorporate that into your planning. All right, it's a good one. Stay tuned. We'll be back on the break with Make It Last. Hey, it's Bert. You know, I hear a lot from people that the one asset they're most interested in protecting from the devastating cost of assisted living or nursing homes is their own home. The team at Medina Law Group can meet with you to discuss options to help protect that home, including their special Home Sweet Home Trust. It's designed specifically to protect the value of your home in the event that you need long-term care in the future. Just call the experienced elder law attorneys at Medina Law Group at 609-818-0068 to learn more, including your chance to schedule a free consultation. You can also visit medinalawgroup.com to learn more about protecting your assets and the Medina Law Group team. For peace of mind and a solid foundation, call Medina Law Group at 609-818-0068 or visit medinalawgroup.com. All right, welcome back to Make It Last. Uh, we're talking about taxes today, specifically estate and inheritance taxes. Now, these are important ones because there's stuff that you can control based on where you live and in where you're residents. And, you know, I talked in the last segment about the difference between estate taxes and inheritance taxes. Now, remember, estate taxes are based on how much you own and inheritance taxes are based on who you leave it to. 
okay and so you can control both you know both of those things based on where you live and, and some other stuff so where are those numbers well i talked a little bit about pennsylvania and pennsylvania has an inheritance tax but has no estate tax so they're not really concerned about how much you have they're concerned about who you leave it to now in pennsylvania it's pretty straightforward if you leave it to a spouse you pay just about zero zero that's it all right that's not bad that's not bad at all. But if you leave it to a child, if you leave it to one of your children, your grandchildren, basically direct lineal descendants, you pay 4.5% from the first dollar. Okay? So basically it's 4.5%. If you leave it to a sibling, you'll pay 12%. And essentially everybody else but a charity is 15%. So that's the way the inheritance tax works in Pennsylvania. Pretty straightforward. And again, there's no exemptions on how much you start on that. That basically from every dollar. Now, New Jersey, for the longest time, had two taxes, two death taxes. They had an estate tax and they had an inheritance tax. And they still have the estate tax when they're in the process of repealing it. Now, the way that that works is uh, back in the year 2001, New Jersey decoupled from the federal estate tax. They basically unhooked because they used to be lockstep with that. And as the federal estate tax started to increase and was on a process of getting repealed, New Jersey said, no, 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 no. We're going to keep charging uh, an estate tax. And they kept their estate tax number at uh, $675,000. If you left more than six seventy five dollars to somebody, you were going to owe some estate taxes on it. Well, as part of that gas tax compromise back in November, what they did was began the repeal of the estate tax. And so in the year 2016, for the rest of that year, if you died and you have more than 675000 you owed estate tax. Beginning the year 2017, that number increased to $2 million. So basically, you were allowed to keep up $2 million. And you can still die this year and give $2 million because uh, we're in 2017. However, if you wait to die next year, in 2018, just one more year, there is no estate tax. You can leave an unlimited amount and there'd be no estate tax. Now, something interesting is going to happen politically, which is that we're going to change over governors. And Chris Christie is not allowed to run again. It's maximum terms. So we're definitely going to have a new governor. And a lot of pundits are predicting that rather than lay, let the estate tax go altogether, after there's a new governor in place, and depending on the political leanings of that governor, there'll be a new estate tax put in. Either we'll stay at the $2 million or some other number, but I, I kind of uh, I kind of sign, I sign, agreed with that. You know, I signed up for it. I think that we'll have an estate tax back. And that's largely because about the amount of money that the estate tax generates. If you look at the budget, the uh, estate tax generates about $360 million or did in 2015. It generated about $360 million. And the inheritance tax generates $370 million. They're about equal. Now, the gas tax did not eliminate the inheritance tax. So New Jersey still has an inheritance tax based on who you leave it to. Okay. Now, different rules in Pennsylvania. Remember, Pennsylvania, zero to spouses and, uh, you know, four and a half to kids on the first dollar and then, um, you know, 12% to siblings and 15% to everyone else, minus charities. The way that New Jersey does it, there is no inheritance tax if you leave it to a spouse or kids, right? No matter how much you leave. So, in fact, the inheritance tax doesn't affect most people who are leaving it to spouses and kids. That's not bad. There's... Another tax that starts at 11% if you're going to need, leave it to um, brothers or sisters, okay, brothers or sisters, or um, surviving spouses of a deceased child. So if you leave it to them, it's 11% and goes up to 16%, depending on how much you leave, with the first $25,000 excluded. Let's try that again. That's a lot of numbers. Stick with me. If you're going to leave it to your brother and sister and it's under 25000 there's no tax. If you leave more than 25000 it's 11% and goes up from there. Okay. Now, everyone else, everyone else, 15%. So nieces and nephews, 15%. You're going to leave $10,000 to your favorite friend that plays bingo with you, 15%. 
And that's on the first 700,000. And after that, it's 16%. Okay. And then basically charities are exempt. So New Jersey still has an inheritance tax and we, and there's nothing in the new current law that gets rid of that. More importantly, this inheritance tax comes with it a lien on your assets. Now I'm going to get you to some practical planning. Remember in this third segment, I always try to give you something that you can use in your planning. And so New Jersey's inheritance tax basically requires financial institutions to lock down your money when you die so that New Jersey is essentially guaranteed to get paid. And so it locks down a percentage of your money. There's one way to avoid that, which is to create a revocable living trust. So New Jersey doesn't know who you're going to be leaving money to. They put the lien on everybody's assets. They don't know what your will says or what your trust says. or They have no idea. And because they have no idea, they're going to automatically lock everybody's account so that you make sure that you get paid if you're the state of New Jersey. So if you want to avoid that automatic lien on your assets, the best thing you can do is create a revocable living trust because a revocable living trust avoids the lien. So, so right in the Department of Treasury, you want to go to the, the Division of Taxation Inheritance Tax. It says the lien may not be applied to assets held in a bona fide trust. So it's pretty good, right? Pretty good. So we create revocable living trusts as a kind of like a default planning in New Jersey because we our clients want to avoid the inheritance tax. Now, there are some special rules in there. All right. So for instance, New Pennsylvania and New Jersey both exempt inheritance tax on life insurance. So one nice way of planning is if you want to leave a specific amount to your niece or nephew and you don't want that to be taxed, you can take out a small insurance policy and just name that person as a beneficiary, the niece or nephew. And that would escape inheritance tax for both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Some people want to think about gifting assets, transferring assets and getting it out of their name so that they don't have to have it in their estate and therefore it's not going to be taxed. Well, there's a couple of rules on that. Nobody allows deathbed gifts. You can't just do it and then die right afterwards. They're going to roll that back into the estate. Now, in Pennsylvania, you have uh, to live one year before those monies are exempt from inheritance tax. So you're going to make the gift and live one year. And if you have no control over it, then it won't be taxed. In New Jersey, it's three years. Three years. If you make a transfer within three years of death to somebody that would have ordinarily had to have paid um, some inheritance tax, it's going to come rolled back in. And they ask for, you know, have you made any transfers in the last three years? So they, they are, they're ready to go. You know, they're ready to take that money. So gifting is sometimes an option, but remember when you gift an asset, you don't get a basis adjustment. Um, don't have much time to go through that, but a basis adjustment is really just the ability to uh, kind of hit the reset button on all the capital gains. You pay capital gains at like 15%. You don't want to be doing that to say four and a half percent of uh, of of an inheritance tax like in Pennsylvania. So you just kind of want to watch these things. And of course, here we go. You want to work with a competent professional, seek the guidance of somebody that knows about this stuff as an expert. Hey, why don't you talk to an estate planning and elder law attorney who's also a certified financial planner? Because that will help you make sure that your affairs are in order. But yes, gifting is an option in the right circumstance. In fact, I'm just wrapping up a plan today for a client where we're going to be making some gifts to uh, help escape the 4.5% because they're Pennsylvania residents. So something to think about definitely for your planning. So keep an eye on this stuff, and I'll be helping you keep an eye uh, in the show along the way. Um, look, I'm going to go back to uh, my wedding anniversary. Um, <laughs> I'm on the road somewhere. I'm going to be in Montreal, Boston, someplace like that, uh, and I'm uh, going to spend it with my delightful wife who has uh, done me the grace of being married to me and saying yes and then staying married with me and giving me three great, 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 great sons, great children. Anyway, um, stick with us. Uh, make it last. Uh, we're going to be back next week. Um, we're going to talk about another great topic. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes. If you uh, like this show and you want to help a friend, share it with them. Either send them to the iTunes link or send them to the radio show link, which you can find at Make It Last Radio. Dot com. Um, and uh, if you have any suggestions for any shows, uh, please go ahead and send it to feedback at makeitlastradio.com or drop me a line. Be happy to talk about uh, what we can include on the show, make this interesting for you as well. Always looking for new topics. So until then, this has been Make It Last, helping you keep your legal ducks in a row and your financial nest egg secure. We will catch you next Saturday. See you later. The foregoing content reflects the opinions of Medina Law Group, LLC, and Private Client Capital Group, LLC, and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment or legal advice or a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security or to follow any legal strategy. There is no guarantee that the strategies, statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. 
Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses, which would reduce returns. All investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There's no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. We recommend that you consult with a professional dedicated to your needs.